I was uh, tasked by Jintanat and the organizing committee to present an overview of the use of animal models um, to advance HIV prevention, treatment, and cure. And this is a really big topic, so what I hope to do is just hit some of the highlights for you today. And in addition to that, I'll try to keep up a pretty quick pace so that anyone with jet lag or postprandial sleepiness right now, we can keep that at bay. Let's see. I'm trying to advance the slides that just... Okay, here we go. Um, so here's the outline of my talk today. Um, first, I'll give an overview of non-human primate models. Then I'll talk a little bit about pathogenesis or tran and transmission, lessons we've learned from infant natural hosts. Um, then I'll move on to prevention and just briefly touch upon some vaccine um, regimens as well as some monoclonal antibodies. And then finally round it out with some new studies into HIV cure and using animal mod models to study virus persistence in infants. I will not touch upon um, some more treatment aspects of using antiretroviral therapy for PMTCT. These are older studies. Um, nor will I touch upon the virologic and immunologic determinants of postnatal transmission in breast milk. But I did want to point these out at the beginning because these are other areas where both infant and maternal animal, animal models have played a key role. So to start with the overview of non-human non -human primate models. As you know, HIV-1 and HIV-2 originated from strains of SIV found in African monkey species naturally infected with SIV in the wild. And on this slide, I'm depicting a number of these so-called natural hosts to show that HIV-1 came from the virus that infects chimpanzees, or SIV-CPZ, and HIV-2 came from the virus that affects, infects Sudimangabes, or SIV-SMM. I also wanted to show you that uh, rhesus macaques on these, this slide uh, that are considered non-natural hosts because these animals are not naturally infected with SIV in the wild can be infected experimentally with a strain of SIV MAC. And this is also derived from the SIV SMM virus. Although SIV MAC and HIV-2 are genetically similar in composition, it should be noted that SIV MAC infection of rhesus macaques is more pathogenic and behaves more similar to HIV-1 infection in humans. Trying to advance, sorry. Okay, here we go. Um, so just to highlight some of the similarities between HIV infection of humans and SIV infection of rhesus macaques to show you sort of why we use this model in the lab. Um, both infections are chronic, progressive, immunosuppressing, immunosuppressing infections that are associated with opportunistic infections and CNS involvement. The kinetics of viremia is characterized by an acute peak and a post-peak decline, and this is in adult rhesus macaques. In infant rhesus macaques, there is a more gradual decline of viremia, similar to what you would see in an untreated HIV-infected infant. There's the presence of a vigorous but ultimately ineffective innate and adaptive immune response to the virus. The key pathogenic events are similar, and these include chronic immune activation, mucosal immune dysfunction, microbial translocation, and high-level infection of central memory CD4-positive T cells. In addition, there have been described some more benign cases of SIV infection in rhesus macaques, similar to what you see in a long-term non-progressor or an elite controller in HIV infection. And virus replication can be suppressed with antiretroviral therapy, leading to virus persistence in reservoirs of latently infected cells. So all of these things put together have led some to postulate that the rhesus macaque model of SIV infection is perhaps the best animal model ava available for any human disease. So I'll just point out some of the advantages to using non-human primate models to study key pathogenic events, or even treatment and um, cure modalities. So we have a, a lot of experimental control. We can infect the monkeys with a defined virus inoculum and dose. The timing and route of infection can be planned. Multiple different routes can be assessed. 
Um, in addition, and really sort of critical to this model is uh, the ability to sample tissues, um, including at ne elective necropsy, which means we have access to the spleen, lymph nodes, gastrointestinal tract, and the brain. Um, in addition, adherence to treatment can be assured in the rhesus macaques. Uh, we don't have to deal with access to antiretrovirals. Um, and we can test risky interventions that maybe are not quite ready for our prime time clinical trial. So much of the work I will talk about today has been performed at the seven U.S. government funded primate research centers, which are shown on the United States map there. Um, more specifically, I'll talk a lot about work that was performed at the Yerkes Non-Human Primate Research Center in Atlanta, Georgia. But since we're in France, I thought I would also point out the Infectious Disease Models for Innovation and Therapy, or IDMIT, that is a, a part of or affiliated with ANRS that is located just outside of Paris and is a very active primate research center. So now moving on to pathogenesis and transmission. One area that has greatly informed the use of, uh, that has greatly, has been and greatly informed, I'm sorry, by the use of non-human primate models, both adult and infant models, is in the area of HIV pathogenesis. So here I'm just giving a snapshot of the work in this field of research. So as I mentioned earlier, African non-human primates such as sooty mangabees and African green monkeys differ from non-natural hosts, which are rhesus macaques and humans, um, in, that, in the area of viral pathogenesis. So just highlighted here on this slide, I'm showing that the natural hosts do not progress to AIDS, so they have a non-pathogenic infection compared to the non-natural hosts, humans and rhesus macaques, that as we know, do progress to AIDS. Um, this is characterized by a healthy level of peripheral CD4 T cells in the natural host, which is opposite to what we see in non-natural hosts. And this is all in the face of high viremia in the natural hosts and in the non-natural hosts. So that was sort of the first interesting finding that, okay, we don't, these natural hosts don't progress to AIDS, they don't lose their CD4 count, but they have a high level of viremia. So a, a lot of work over the past 20 years has gone into trying to characterize these natural hosts and, and what makes them so unique. And I'll just point out um, a couple of the features um, that are summarized in this table. So the level of chronic immune activation is a, a distinction between these two groups of, of animals. So the natural hosts have very low systemic immune activation during chronic infection, whereas as we know in humans and rhesus macaques, the level of systemic immune activation is quite high in untreated infection. And some of this relates to the pattern of infected cells. I won't go into this uh, in great detail, but particular subsets of CD4 positive memory T cells are involved in the infections of the natural versus the non-natural host. And this seems to play a role in the immune activation and um, uh, sort of what goes on in the lymph nodes of those animals. Um, and finally, one thing that we've noted in natural host uh, sooty mangabees at the Yerkes colony and others have noted in natural host African green monkeys and other natural hosts in the wild is that vertical transmission from mother to infant is extremely rare in the natural host, which we know is distinct from what we see in the non-natural host. And we found that the level of transmission from mother to infant is directly correlated with the expression of CCR5 on CD4 positive T cells in these infants. And as you know, CCR5 is the main co-receptor for both HIV and SIV infection of CD4 T cells. So this is a, for the most part, necessary component to a cell for HIV to infect that particular cell. So what's shown in this slide um, on both the left is total CD4 T cells and on the right is memory CD4 T cells, is in rhesus macaques, or non-natural hosts, you see high levels of CCR5 expression on CD4 T cells in multiple anatomic locations, particularly in the gastrointestinal tract, the jejunum and the colon. Um, in addition, in the sooty mangabees that are shown in red, we see extremely low levels of this CCR5 uh, molecule on the CD4 positive T cells. Um, the level of target cells at mucosal sites determines the rate of transmission, as I mentioned, and that is shown in this um, graphical picture. So in the newborn and breastfed African non-human primates, extremely low levels of CCR5, as I mentioned. Um, and as those, those non-human primates, those natural hosts age, their level of 
um, CCR5 expression increases. And then this is a picture showing kind of what you would typically see in rhesus macaques and humans. And as I mentioned already, the expression of this CCR5 molecule in the natural host adult, so it increases as they get older, is restricted to a particular subset of memory T cells. Um, and this seems to play a role in their level of immune activation as well as the virus pathogenesis. And I just wanted to quickly point out a recent article that came from the group of Philip Goulder that was published in Science Translation, Translational Medicine that describes a group of what he termed pediatric non-progressors. And these are vertically HIV-infected children that were greater than five years old um, at the time of this analysis living in South Africa. They maintain high CD4 T cell counts with high viral loads they're naive to antiretroviral therapy, have a low level of systemic immune activation, and low CCR5 expression on their central memory CD4 positive T cells. So these sound surprisingly like the natural host that I've just described to you. So this is just really a, was a very interesting article. Um, and it's the first time that we've seen sort of along this um, formerly straight line in the non-natural hosts we used to think of virus pathogenesis and virus replication as being directly correlated. And here we have, as you see, the natural hosts up here who have high virus replication and low pathogenesis. And this is the first time that we're seeing a human population added to this group, particularly a pediatric human population. So now I'll move on to just a brief overview of some of the, the prevention modalities that are being explored in infant non-human primates. This was a study published quite some time ago by the group of Dan Baruch, who was assessing whether accelerated uh, vaccine, adenovirus vaccine, given to neonatal rhesus monkeys could elicit um, vaccine-specific immune responses or, or SIV-specific immune responses. Um, and they looked at a four-week prime boost schedule. And the idea behind this is if you are looking to immunize a neonate to protect against breastfeeding transmission, you want to be able to do it quickly and get those immune responses up during the period of highest exposure. So they found that they could induce SIV-specific CD8 T cell responses in blood and tissues. Uh, in more recent work by the group of Christina de Paris, um, I'm showing here on this slide some parallel testing of vaccine strategies. And this is just to point out another use of the non-human primate model. So she's testing um, MVA and HIV envelope protein immunization, and basically just testing sort of different components of the vaccine and given at different times. And she primarily focused on the humoral immune response, looking at vaccine-induced binding antibodies and their avidity. Um, and these and other data are being used to guide a capsule proposal for pediatric vaccine trials within the IMPACT network. Uh, next, another exciting area um, in prevention research is the use of monoclonal antibodies for the prevention of mother-to-child transmission, in addition also um, for therapy. Um, and typically these are what we would call broadly neutralizing antibodies. So you could think of using these as post-exposure prophylaxis in newborns just after birth. Uh, during exposure prophylaxis in breastfeeding infants. Um, in addition, potentially their use um, may be important in reducing viral reservoir establishment in addition to antiretroviral therapy. And some of the advantages of using these monoclonal antibodies is that they will require less frequent dosing than daily antiretroviral therapy. There's less potential for toxicity. Some of the disadvantages is at this point they're given by injection um, there needs to be a cold chain, and development of resistance has been described. And I wanted to highlight this exciting story that came out of the group of Nancy Haywood. Um, this was using infant non-human primates, and they used a combination of these broadly neutralizing antibodies called PGT-121 and BRCO7. These are antibodies that bind to the HIV envelope. Um, and they gave them to infant non-human primates, um, at several intervals over the course of 10 days. Um, and they showed in animals that were infected with SHIV, or simian human immunodeficiency virus that contains the HIV envelope, that a day or two after infection, they were able to find in the blue and the green levels of virus in multiple different tissues. 
In those animals that received no broadly neutralizing antibodies, the infection became widespread by day 14. And in those animals who received the broadly neutralizing antibody cocktail, there was no evidence of infection. So it appears that these, this cocktail of antibodies may have actually cleared the virus from these infants. Next, I'll move on to our studies of, of SIV cure. So the use of non-human primates for cure studies uh, in, these, in this work, we're able to control for and determine clinical parameter, parameters that are virtually impossible to control for in humans. I've mentioned this before, but the identity, dose, and route of virus challenge, the time of infection, the duration of antiretroviral therapy, as well as adherence. In addition, uh, and kind of a recent advance in this area, is that newer antiretroviral therapy regimens, including integrase inhibitors, result in suppression of viremia to levels that are on par with long-term ART-treated HIV-infected individuals. I've also mentioned this already, so I'll just glide right through it, but we can perform longitudinal collections as well as elective necropsy. And we can test novel interventions for HIV eradication, so combinations of immunologic therapy, cell depletion, stem cell transplant, et cetera. And finally, analytical treatment interruptions can be performed in these animals without needing to have complicated clinical decision rules for when you, can, when you must restart antiretroviral therapy in that patient. We can stop therapy and sort of see the full dynamics of viral rebound. So I just wanted to uh, go over a pilot study we performed uh, in my lab of SIV reservoirs and infant rhesus macaques. So we had four four-month-old rhesus macaques that were infected orally with two doses of SIV MAC251. At week five after infection, they were put on triple formulation antiretroviral therapy, which included tenofovir, emtricitabine, and dolutegravir. They were placed on this therapy for six to nine months and then euthanized uh, for elective necropsy at the end of that time on therapy for sort of a full characteriz characterization of cellular and anatomic reservoirs. Here I'm just showing you the viral loads in those four infants. Um, and by comparison, I'm showing uh, suppression on ART in a, in a larger cohort of adult rhesus macaques. So we found that antiretroviral therapy uh, induced a decline in the level of SIV DNA in CD4 positive T cells, as you might expect, as well as a recovery <clears throat> of CD, circulating CD4 T cell count. We wanted to look at the cellular composition of the viral reservoir in these animals. And so at necropsy, we, this is in the peripheral blood, we sorted a number of different cell subsets. So naive, memory stem cells, central memory, and effector memory T cells in order to look at the level of SIV DNA within those cells. So overall, we found in, in this small study that there wasn't really any signif statistically significant differences between the, each of these different cell subsets as a reservoir. But when you take into account their relative proportions within the peripheral blood, we noted that the naive T cell pool was a, the largest contributor to the level of SIV DNA. And we've done some um, assays subsequent to this where we looked at whether that virus in those naive T cells was replication competent. So could, you, could it go on to infect a new cell? And indeed it is. And this is not something that you see in adults with great frequency. So this is something that's very unique to the infant model. We also looked in lymphoid uh, tissue. So as I mentioned, we have access to lymph nodes as well as the spleen. And we performed the same type of analysis, looking at the level of SIV DNA in a variety of different CD4 T cell subsets. So again, in lymph nodes, we found that the naive T cells were a large component of the viral reservoir. Uh, in addition, the central memory and the T follicular helper cells contributed to that reservoir. Whereas in the spleen, the effector memory cells were actually the greatest contributor to the reservoir. We next looked at the levels of SIV RNA. So this is virus that's being expressed even in the setting of antiretroviral therapy. And for this study, we compared our four antiretroviral suppressed animals to a cohort of uh, viremic animals that were infected with the same virus and, and infected for approximately the same amount of time. So this analysis was performed by Jake Estes at NCI, um, and he performed SIV RNA scope in situ hybridization, looking for virus within the tissues. Um, and so what you can see here in um, 
Red open circles are the viremic infants, and then in closed orange circles are our suppressed infants. Um, and so what we found was that in the spleen and these two different lymph nodes, uh, mesenteric lymph nodes and superficial lymph nodes, that the level of SIV RNA was lower in the art-treated infants, which you would expect. When we looked at the GI tract as well as the brain, we sort of came up with a, an interesting finding that, that we're still trying to understand. But we found that in the lamina propria, as well as in the gray and white matter of the brain, the level of SIV RNA was not different in the viremic as compared to the art-treated animals. Um, and this is something, as I mentioned, we're, we're sort of following up to, to really understand. These are very low levels of SIV RNA, um, so I don't want to make too much of it, but, but we're pursuing that further. Um, and there, we do have some recently funded grants where we're going to sort of explore the cure and remission strategies in gr much greater detail in a larger number of non-human primates. So um, in R01, I was recently awarded to study a couple of different vaccine modalities as, whether, as well as immune interventions in SIV-infected art-suppressed infant macaques. And this program project grant that we're conducting as a collaboration with Sally Permar from Duke, who's the PI, to try to understand the predictors of viral rebound in infant rhesus macaques. So in summary, I hope I've shown you that non-human primate models have informed our understanding of HIV pathogenesis, treatment, prevention, and cure. And infant non-human primate models in particular, I think, are useful for studying PMTCT as well as cure and remission approaches. Um, and these animal models serve as a highly translatable system to test novel interventions that can then be formally evaluated in clinical trials. So thank you for your attention. I'd also like to acknowledge the members of my lab that contributed to this work, our Emory collaborators, particular, particularly Mirko Pajardini and my husband Guido Silvestri, as well as all of the folks at the Yerkes National Primate Research Center, veterinarians and animal resource staff without whom this work really could not be possible. Um, and our collaborators at UNC, NCI Frederick, Duke, as well as the Center for Infectious Disease Research. And finally, Gilead and V for providing, providing all of the antiretroviral therapy for these studies and our funders as well, AMFAR and NIH. Thank you. <laughs>